us as a background, access and participation in education and opportunities for uh, sanctuary seekers has always been an area of uh, significant interest uh, and work for many universities. But this year especially, we have recognized the role of universities in welcoming and fostering safe environments, um, and, and had, this has become more important than ever in both the local and the global context. Since this movement of universities of sanctuary started, um, we have seen how universities can have an invaluable role in creating welcoming communities and practices within and beyond their campuses. So um, I'm Mariam Tahar and I coordinate the Universities of Sanctuary program. And I'm delighted to be joined today by four uh, fantastic representatives and champions for sanctuary work at their universities and beyond. Uh, so the, the four speakers will speak today about their activity in the past year, and they will offer a perspective on how they have been expanding welcome, uh, but also will ad address or um, comment on some of the challenges and the lessons that they learned along the way. Firstly, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Linda Morris. Uh, Linda is a reader in education and migration at the University of Sussex. She has researched and published widely in the field of refugee education and integration in the UK and has led and collaborated on numerous externally funded research projects. Between 2017 and 2020, she was an academic advisor to the UK Home Office um, on issues of refugee integration and is co-author of the UK Home Office's 2019 Refugee Indicators of Integration Framework. She has particular expertise in participatory and peer research with refugees, and she co-leads sanctuary work at the University of Sussex Sanctuary Group. And she's also a member of the Brighton and Hove Sanctuary on Sea Group. Prior to university, uh, Linda worked in community education and development for 16 years. So it's my pleasure to um, pass you over to Linda to introduce her presentation to you today. Great, thank you very much, um, Mariam, for that lovely introduction. And um, thank you for inviting me to speak about the University of um, Sussex and our sanctuary work. Um, I co-lead um, our group, as Mariam has said, um, with my colleague, uh, Dr. Judith Town Townend. Um, so I'm speaking on behalf of us both. So the University of Sussex um, achieved sanctuary status in May 2020. And before then, um, we'd had a number of grassroots activities and initiatives by academics and professional services staff. Um, for example, three academic colleagues are part of Brighton and Hove Sanctuary on Sea Group and have been for, for many years since its inception. Um, so we had a grassroots movement that maybe met once a year um, twice a year, but it wasn't until 2020 that we galvanised our energies and came together to actually form ourselves into a, a group. And it's sort of some of the values that have come out of that, the value of that and the benefits to the university um, and to our work that I want to, to try and highlight. So um, firstly, it's given a focus to our work. There was lots of disparate pockets of work coming on. Uh, going on, but we now have a, a website, a clear website, and you, there's a quote there from our University of Sanctuary website. Um, and you can see, I think, from that quote that the award very much fits with how the university sees itself or likes to see itself. Um, we were the first university to start awarding Mandela scholarships to um, South Africans in the apartheid era back in 1973. And the university has always very much seen itself as committed to social justice and a bit radical. And these, uh, um, and this has been quite helpful, I think, in helping us establish um, a whole university approach. I mean, the university is publicly committed to the City of Sanctuary Charter and also sees this, this sanctuary work as part of its commitment to the Sustainable Development Goal um, number four, for inclusive and equitable quality education and promoting lifelong learning for all. So the website provides a very public and visible recognition of our, of our status. It's a central space for gathering together initiatives and ideas, but most importantly, it has a named point of contact on sanctuary issues. Um, so anyone outside the university wishing to contact us or raise um, an issue can do so directly. Um, and crucially, students within the university um, from a sanctuary background can reach out to somebody who can um, support them navigate through what is a very complex um, system um, of support with, with, different, with different groups. So, so that's been a key 
a key benefit for us. The other um, uh, benefit, I think, and value of our sanctuary work is it's an a actually enabled us to bring people together across the university um, and to get the right people around um, the table. We have a steering group um, which meets every term alongside the forum, which is a broader group of people. But the forum is, as you can see the composition there, um, we have uh, people from all the major and most important parts of the university. So we have representatives from the widening participation team, student engagement team, our scholarship office. We have a scholarship, an Article 26 scholarship holder on, as part of our group, the communications team, the international office, which works on immigration, our student action for refugees, which is our star group. And that's the photo um, of our star group there. We have um, several academics. Importantly, we also have the university executive group represented because it's really important that you have a, a line of communication to people um, who can make decisions and can make things happen within a university. Um, our alumni and development office is part of um, this group, but also we have external representation. And um, so we have Brighton and Hove City Council sit on our group, as does a representative from one of the local refugee communities. So we're very much concerned with sanctuary within the university, but also outside um, of the university. So I think, um, and I think it's important to, to emphasize as well that within the university, um, the benefits are broader than just the students who come with a forced migrant or refugee um, background, but bringing together and getting the right people around the table um, has enabled us to have a whole institutional response to um, issues of forced migration. And, and I'll, when I come to talk about the um, our achieving scholars, um, that will become that will be the importance of that will become apparent. So within the university, um, we have two undergraduate Article Twenty Six scholarships. We have a Master's uh, Article Twenty Six scholarship, one uh, PhD. Uh, with the Council for At-Risk Academics, and that's every three years uh, we have uh, one of those PhDs. We have integrated sanctuary issues into teaching and research. So for example, we do in, in my own department, we have a large uh, teacher education programme and I teach sessions to uh, trainee teachers on issues about refugees uh, in schools and refugee education. And um, we have several modules Across, across the university on refugee education, migration, etc. cetera. Um, this year we had um, We Belong, a, a fabulous organization, which I'm sure many of you know. Um, they came and they did a training on uh, refugee students in higher education for 40 staff from across the university. We held a migrant welcome social event um, as part of our induction uh, week where we specifically invited people uh, to that. We have a small group of refugee ambassadors who represent refugee issues and are supported through our widening participation team. Um, and as I said, the benefits are broader than those who, than only those who come um, with a forced migrant or refugee background. It benefits the whole, the culture of welcome benefits all of our students, I think. And the other photo there, um, oh, so the first photo there is Adash, who's our, uh, one of our scholars, um, there are Article 26 scholars, and then the other photo there is the breadwinner group, um, and they have just uh, started uh, on campus, they're a charity who work with, a, local, with a, a bakery to support refugees and asylum to gain uh, work experience um, and, and skills and mentoring into employment, so they now have a space on campus where they uh, sell bread on a weekly weekly basis and that's come through our, our, our sanctuary work. So that's our work within the university and our focus there but then we also uh, work outside the university um, and this is important to us. Um, so as I said we're very involved in the sanctuary on sea group um, and the pictures here come from an event um, where Student Action for Refugees, our university uh, group, joined together with our Sanctuary on Sea group and together with refugees to protest the Nationality Borders Bill on the 17th of October. 
um, the event, people wore orange, um, which came from the uh, Refugee Olympic team. They, they wore orange um, and formed a heart on Brighton Beach. And it's a very short video, and I'm just going to play it now because I think it's a nice um, depiction of universities engaging with the local community. Um, and the first speaker um, is Mausia, who's the president of our star group at the university. She's wearing tie-dye orange, which the university students got together and as, a, as an activity to tie-dye orange. And um, the second speaker is um, from our Brighton and Hove Sanctuary group. So I'm just going to very quickly, hopefully, play <clears throat> this. so many of you here today thank you very much for your support uh, and i think this is a really great way to show the world that we're going to video it it's going to go out there so it's right in our all heart for refugees yeah. Um, so just to finish, I wanted to um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about the Cheapening Scholars and what being a University of Sanctuary meant. Um, as you know, probably all of you, that the Cheapening is a Foreign Commonwealth Development Office um, scholarship scheme. Um, <clears throat> in mid-August, when uh, things started unravelling dramatically in Afghanistan, uh, the Foreign Office said it was cancelling the Cheapening Scholarships. Um, there was an outcry um, and a, a lot of pressure was exerted and then the government did reverse that decision. Um, at Sussex, um, we were at the forefront of that campaigning to get that decision overturned and we had nine of the 36 Afghan Cheapening Scholars at Sussex. Um, four of the scholars arrived with their families um, and were housed in hotels in London. Um, and five arrived, they were unable to bring their families with them, but they, they have arrived on their own and are housed on campus. So the university immediately established a um, Afghan crisis coordinating group. The local authority immediately established an Afghan crisis coordinating group so to look after the, the families. And one of the things that our sanctuary group not only enabled such a rapid response, but also has um, very much work to coordinate the response to ensure that there's equity, equity of support across these two, these, um, two groups. Um, our alumni group with whom we work immediately established the Afghan Hardship Fund there, um, which uh, is, is, is growing um, to support not only our achieving scholars, but um, our other students from Afghanistan who now had their, uh, any money um, from Afghanistan, obviously frozen and, and very hard to get hold of. Um, one of the scholars, Naimat, um, who's pictured there, he's been very public in posting, tweeting and posting, and he's very publicly talked about his story here, and our communications team was able to sort of support 
um, on that in terms of what what goes into the public domain and, and what, what what perhaps is less is, is less um, significant to go in or, or possibly harmful. Um, and I'm hoping these slides will get shared because he, he tells a great story, um, you know, about what a terrible experience, uh, you know, it was at, at Kabul Airport at that time. So I'm going to end there um, just to say, you know, it is still hard and it is an ongoing learning process being a university of sanctuary. I wouldn't say that Sussex has cracked it in any way. Um, we work in an incredibly hostile um, uh, and difficult environment and the scholarships and what we can do feels like a drop in the ocean sometimes and that can feel very hard um, and there are many issues that we grab, grapple with around deservingness and this sort of moral economy which comes with when nationalities are prioritised and different groups are prioritised um, and that's something I'm very happy to discuss some of those struggles that we um, that we work with um, in, the, in the discussion afterwards but thank you I'll end there thank you Mariam Thank you so much, Linda, for that fantastic presentation and to see the important work you do, but also reflecting, as you said, on the difficulties. And thank you for um, offering to discuss that and, and really kind of presenting the, the reality um, of, of the situation. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I would be delighted to introduce the next speaker, uh, Rachel Sanderson. Rachel is a vice principal in external relations at the University of Glasgow. Uh, she's a member of the university's senior management team, so her responsibilities include um, many roles from strategic leadership for domestic and international student recruitment, uh, from undergraduate and postgraduate admissions, to partnership development, fundraising, um, and alumni relations and widening participation. She is also the university's refugee and asylum seeker champion, um, and she's a chartered marketer and the case global trustee. Rachel is a member of the University's Scotland International Committee, and she sits on a number of sector advisory boards. She is also the University of Glasgow's senior leader for the Universitas 21 Network, the Guild of European Research Intensive Universities, and the Civis European University Alliance. I'm delighted to introduce uh, Rachel, and I will uh, share uh, her presentation um, in a few seconds. It's a real pleasure to join you this afternoon. Um, as Mariam has said, I am the Refugee and Asylum Seeker Champion for the University of Glasgow, which is a role that hasn't existed for um, too long at the institution. So we're, we're on a kind of journey to developing lots of the activities that we want to deliver in this space. Um, and what I should also point out first and foremost is that we are not currently a University of Sanctuary, but we have submitted our bid to become one, uh, which I know is being looked at right now by Mariam and others. So, um, so fingers crossed, fingers crossed that actually we will soon be a University of Sanctuary. Um, Mariam, if you could move on to the next slide, please, that would be great. Um, and what I wanted to say is just that actually that journey to becoming a University of Sanctuary has been incredibly, incredibly important for the University of Glasgow. And I think it's given us a real focus um, and impetus to really look pan institution and pan sector at what support institutions are putting into place to support refugee and asylum seeker communities. So as the champion, I actually report into the Equality and Diversity Strategy Committee. So there is a sort of senior leadership governing board that is chaired by our principal and vice chancellor, Professor Sir Anton Moscatelli, which means issues around providing support to refugee and asylum seekers within our community actually has a kind of uh, a sort of locus within that committee and a continual focus um, throughout the year. But one of the things that we did very quickly, actually, was just as Linda has said, and actually I will, I will probably be echoing much of Linda's sentiments uh, during this very short presentation. But one of the things that was enormously beneficial was pulling together a cross-institutional University of Sanctuary working group. And that really pulled together academic colleagues with professional services colleagues from across the university community but also critically included students with lived experience. And that was something that I felt was absolutely vital, that a lot of the time you're looking at the issues and I think I understand what the problems are and what the solutions are. And actually in talking to students with lived experience, I actually gained a much, much richer understanding of the particular things that caused them the greatest um, difficulties as, as a member of our community. Um, so we actually ran some very specific focus groups with students with 
lived experience and then invited some of those students to join that University of Sanctuary working group and, and that was absolutely critical um, and has been enormously beneficial. Something else that's really simple um, and I'm sure many other universities have this in place as well, but we have named points of contact for refugee and asylum seekers who are looking to join the University of Glasgow. Um, and actually, Dr. Martin Irwin, I think, is joining us today. So I think he is on this call joining the conference. So hello, Martin. Uh, Martin does an incredible job of supporting our refugee and asylum seeker students from the point of initial contact from, you know, that initial inquiry uh, to actually supporting students throughout their student journey with us at the university as well. And a big point of that job and a big focus is in signposting resources, you know, being able to share where support lies within the university. And as Linda says, this is really complicated. It's difficult stuff that we're trying to address when it comes to immigration law and how to apply through UCAS and looking at funding status and actually having someone like Martin that is really expert in this space, being a name point of contact that anyone can get in touch with and have a conversation with um, has been yeah, just, just really transformational. And um, alongside that, we have a range of dedicated scholarships for both refugee and asylum seeker students. And that is something that we are really seeking to develop over the course of the next year. Um, but we have also taken the decision as an organization of ensuring that asylum seekers are given home fee status at the point of application. Now this doesn't happen across the board and it is very, very challenging when an asylum seeker is given an international fee status because really we are entirely limiting their ability to gain access to the institution. So we have made the decision that from the outset they will gain home fee status. And in Scotland, for those that aren't aware, refugee students actually do not have to pay uh, for uh, tuition at universities. So they are granted home fee status and they're given um, access to funding through the Student Awards Agency for Scotland. So what we're trying to do is create a sort of level playing field here and um, ensuring that asylum seekers are given that home fee status too. We, of course, have adjusted admissions offers in place. Um, and we are looking at ways in which we can support students to gain access. We actually have an access program that is run through our kind of lifelong learning team. And it, it's, it's hugely beneficial at Glasgow that actually all of these teams sit within the directorate that I lead. So they all sit within external relations. So actually being able to um, kind of flex and rethink the way that we do things um, has been really helped by the fact that all of the teams are there and can work very collaboratively together to kind of identify where there are particular issues that we should be able to find solutions for. So for the access program, actually, we knew that there were many refugee and asylum seekers students that would have to come through an access program. But actually, the initial barrier was being able to pay for that program. So we have just waived the fee entirely for that program. And that has helped. And Martin would be able to pop in the chat. But I think over 30 um, students have actually come through that route this year because there was no longer that fee in place. And it really is about providing that support from pre-application right through to graduation. Um, and Mariam, if you could just move on to the next slide, that would be great. I'm very conscious of time. Thank you. And actually, just to Linda's point as well, one of the first things we also did was try to pull information from across the university's digital estate into dedicated web pages for asylum seekers and refugee students. So actually from this page, we are linking to all different parts of the university where there is information about admissions, information about funding, um, uh, information about support that's available as a member of our community, um, and also some of the links and partnerships that we have with external organizations as well. So there is now kind of a one-stop shop for those that are seeking information about joining the university if they find themselves in uh, you know, being uh, referenced as asylum seekers or as refugee students. Uh, thanks, Mariam. And, and this is something that's come out so strongly to me in, in being engaged in this work over the course of the last couple of years, and that is the absolute power of partnership. So, you know, we would not be able to do the work that we are doing as an institution without the expertise and support and the drive that comes from engaging with all of these different organizations. And this is just a snapshot of some of the organizations that we, we are engaging with um, to greatest effect right now. So, of course, Universities of Sanctuary, and as I said, I really hope that we will become a University of Sanctuary in the not too distant future. 
but we're also uh, linking directly in with the Scottish Refugee Council. We spend a lot of time engaging with them and actually we're very keen to undertake some training that the Scottish Refugee Council are uh, delivering to various organisations um, across the city and across the country. And one of the things that many of you may not be aware of, but Glasgow City Council is the only local authority in the country to take an asylum seekers through the UK government's dispersal scheme. So we have a really sizable refugee and asylum seeker population in the city of Glasgow. And so we're also engaging not just with the Scottish Refugee Council, but also with integration units um, that are very closely located next to the university campus as well. A few others I just wanted to very quickly pick out. Uh, Gramnet uh, links researchers, practitioners, NGOs and policymakers working with migrants, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, we're also very thankful that at Glasgow we have a UNESCO chair, um, so it's a UNESCO Ryler chair and that is Refugee Integration Through Languages and the Arts. Um, Professor Alison Phipps, who I'm sure is known to many of you, um, but she also supports and leads on our Gramnet activities as well, which is a sort of University of Glasgow led venture, but also connecting in with, with other institutional partners and other organisational partners as well. As Linda mentioned, we work really closely with STAR, so our Student Action for Refugee Society, as well as other societies. There are actually, alongside STAR, there's a number of student societies that exist in support of uh, refugee and asylum seeker students. And um, every year I try to get together with those societies to understand what they have planned, look at ways in which we can be supporting them, but also helping to ensure that they are in kind of forming and influencing us on the things that will matter most to these groups. And lastly, Refuigi. Uh, Refuigi is a fantastic charity in Glasgow, for those that won't be aware. And this is all about providing a warm welcome to refugee and asylum seeker students who find themselves here. And um, they do amazing things. They create care packages. Uh, they write letters to uh, refugee and asylum seekers who, who come into the city of Glasgow. Um, and just, yeah, they're just a fabulous charity for us to engage with. And so we try and enable some of our students to undertake kind of internships and work experience with Refugee, and we've also raised some money specifically for Refugee through external relations and um, over the course of the last year as well. Next slide, Mariam. And um, one of the other things that I just wanted to point to is the work that's been undertaken by University Scotland. So actually University Scotland, uh, just earlier this month in fact, uh, relaunched a publication. There had been some work done on this maybe about five or six years ago um, and they've completely refreshed it in 2021 and it is guidance for universities on providing asylum seekers and refugees with access to higher education and it specifically points to best practice in that admission space. So um, for those that have an interest you can download the PDF from the University of Scotland website um, and it's definitely worth a read because even for those institutions outside of Scotland I think it points to some really you know innovative thinking ways in which we can reshape some and redefine some of our policies and um, to ensure that we are not providing a, a block to access to higher education but actually supporting it through some of the work that we can do internally um, and thank you so much Gun, who's, who's basically providing all of the links in the chat so thank you you're doing you're doing an excellent job of uh, kind of cross-referencing a uh, uh, activities and initiatives that i'm sharing in this presentation so thank you so much for that and then my final slide which is next steps for us. So as I mentioned, we created the advisory group really to help us on that journey to becoming a university of sanctuary, but very quickly realized that there was um, real benefit in bringing together this internal group of stakeholders um, on a more frequent basis. So although we have submitted our university of sanctuary uh, bid, actually we want to retain that group going forward and, and actually use that group to hold myself and others accountable for the work that we have said that we will set out to deliver in that University of Sanctuary bid. And we're also signing an MOU with CARA, so the Council for um, At-Risk Academics, and we are committing to £50,000 in ring fence funding on an annual basis to support um, CARA academics. So we actually currently support two CARA academics and we're looking at ways in which we can develop that, uh, that number even further over the course of the next year. I mentioned that Scottish Refugee Council are developing training um, and we've been very, very keen to pilot that training within the University of Glasgow. So we're hoping that's something that we can take forward in 2022. We also do want to increase scholarship funding through targeted philanthropy. So we have humanitarian scholarships available right now, and um, they are far too few in number. Um, and as part of our campaign activities, we are looking at going out to ask to some of our extant donors and new donors 
for money to support scholarships for refugee and asylum seeker students. We will continue to review admissions policies and particularly use that new University Scotland guidance as a sort of best practice blueprint for how we develop our own policies internally. We are also looking at developing an annual events calendar. So, you know, there's Refugee Week, there's lots of things that are happening throughout the year. And we want to make sure that we are kind of galvanizing and harnessing those opportunities to share the stories of our students and academics who have that lived experience, but also some of the research and work that we're doing in that space. And to Linda's point, actually, we're doing a huge amount of work in this area around migration through research projects, but also through learning and teaching. And we have a big project underway right now that sits within our learning and teaching strategy about decolonizing the curriculum. And within that, making sure that we are actually developing uh, courses um, around migration um, and refugee and asylum seekers. And a lot of that work is, is, is underway now. Sharing best practice across the sector. I mean, I think conferences like this one are so vitally important because I, as Linda was talking, I was scribbling lots of things down. Um, and I think being able to share best practice amongst ourselves um, is, is really, really crucial. And, and through that, hopefully we can develop really innovative ways of supporting our refugee and asylum seeker communities. And very last thing, I've mentioned this a few times before, there's no pressure, Mariam and Goon and others, but hopefully in 2022, we will become a University of Sanctuary officially as well. And um, I think with that, um, I, am, I am finished. And apologies, because I may have taken up more time than I ought to, but um, thanks so much, Mariam, for your support in, in driving that presentation. Lovely. Thank you so much, Rachel. Such a fantastic and insightful presentation. And yes, I hope uh, we can celebrate uh, University of Glasgow joining the Universities of Sanctuary Network very soon. Um, next, I would be delighted to introduce uh, our speaker um, from the University of South uh, Wales. Um, so next, you will hear from Dr. Mike Chick. Uh, he is a senior lecturer in TESOL, which is teaching English to speakers of other languages. He is also a refugee champion at the University of South Wales. For over 20 years, Dr. Mike Chick has worked as a teacher um, or a teacher educator in Estonia, Spain, South Korea, Greece, and the UK. He holds a, a PhD in second language teacher education and currently teaches on the BA TESOL modules. Since 2015, he's worked in collaboration with the Welsh Refugee Council and has recently completed research into language education for resettled Syrian families in Wales. In 2019, he won the university-wide award for best societal impact and is currently researching language teacher education specific to language teaching for displaced people. Over to you, Mike. Thanks, Mariam. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes, we can. And can you see the screen? Yes, so we can see the screen perfectly. Thank you. I'm on top of a very dark, wet Welsh mountain and it's not always... Um, uh, uh, reliable the internet, but okay, great. No, uh, but firstly, Prinaun <laughs> uh, Good afternoon, everybody. It's a, a, a real honour, a real uh, uh, privilege to be amongst good colleagues interested in this field. Um, and you know what? Rachel and Linda have said so many things that <laughs> that I was going to say. Uh, our experiences have been very similar, I think, and. Um, I definitely feel that, um, as Rachel was saying, we have so much to share and so much good practice to learn from one another. I'm, I'm really sincerely inspired by what's um, happening in Sussex and Glasgow, and I will be contacting both Linda and Rachel after this, um, if that's okay. But, um, so ever so briefly, I don't, I don't want to bore people by say, repeating the same things. Um, so I guess what I'd like to say is that for any colleagues here who um, are thinking about uh, uh, doing more in the field of supporting people seeking sanctuary, uh, we do live in an unjust world and we do live uh, you know, in an unjust system. And I have no doubt, I've seen it over the last five or six years, that people who work in universities are uniquely placed to make some difference. So although we live in a democracy, we often feel powerless, but if you work in a university, really we are uniquely placed to make a difference to a lot of people's lives. Um, and I hope that uh, colleagues listening today, you know, have been inspired so, so far by, by what Linda and Rachel have said about what can be done. Um, 
And our story at the University of South Wales is pretty similar in truth. Um, so a few years back, uh, we started uh, collaborating seven, eight years ago with the Welsh Refugee Council. It's a third sector organisation based in Cardiff. Every town and city in, in, in the UK will have similar uh, organisation organisations. And we started working with them to provide language education for, for people um, seeking sanctuary in Cardiff. And out of this collaboration, we developed a lot of knowledge, a lot of close contacts with um, folks who were recently arrived. And we realised there was of course, much more we could be doing than simply language support. And so we started offering scholarship schemes and um, places on our pre-sessional English language program. So we know that one of the main barriers to um, forced migrants accessing university is the, the language barrier. So lots of universities um, currently require an IELTS certificate and an IELTS score to get into university. Now, this is prohibitive for two big reasons. Firstly, it's awfully expensive to take courses to prepare yourself for IELTS. And then on top of that, the exam itself is expensive. And then there's the time issue of going through this rigmarole before you actually are able to be offered a place. And so what we, um, what we uh, launched was a scheme whereby we have free access to our pre-sessional language programs, but also we don't require uh, any IELTS or any external examination. We do the assessments free of charge in-house. We've got a, quite a large team of very expert language uh, lecturers who can do the language assessments themselves. There's no need for an IELTS exam. So on top of um, scholarship schemes, we also offer a pretty comprehensive language um, support program. And because of these uh, various initiatives, uh, a couple of years back, I think it was 2019, we thought, hey, let's apply to be uh, a University of Sanctuary. And we did that and met some, some wonderful people from the University of Sanctuary committee who came down and they inspected what we were doing and they gave us some terrific advice. And again, much like Linda has already said and Rachel, um, one of the key pieces of their advice was to bring this, um, this, this group of people from across the university together to make a more formal grouping. At, you know, through working with um, forced migrants in, in higher education, really, uh, everybody wins, it seems to me. I've come to meet the most wonderful people across the university who I wouldn't have met before, I wouldn't have worked with before. And the advice of the inspection committee from the University of Sanctuary folks was, look, you, you, you need to, to come together and, and make a formal group of these folks from marketing and student recruitment and from the international office and from uh, the widening participation group and from the uh, uh, student finance unit and really embed this group of people into the university system. And so we, we did that. And... The way we went about it was we, we, we had this subgroup of people from across the university who were passionate about um, uh, uh, the field. They, it's, everybody wins. I, I'm repeating it because it's so true. And we applied to, to join the, the Equality and Diversity Steering Group. Now, even though being a refugee or being an asylum seeker isn't part of the, the 2010 Equality Act, usually in the majority of cases, Somebody who's a refugee does tick the box of one of the protected characteristics by their race, religion, sexual orientation, or whatever. And so the, the Equality and Diversity Steering Group said, yeah, absolutely, you, you belong with a seat on this, on this board, which gives us direct access to the Vice Chancellor, to the Executive Board of the, of the University. It also means, of course, that in university strategic plans, the university, the sanctuary issues are absolutely key. So we, we now feature, you know, with um, targets, with uh, 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 plans in the university's overall uh, equality plan. It also gives cachet, of course, and gives credibility. So it means that we have a stronger voice when we are applying for um, expanding our scholarship scheme and for securing more money for language provision. 
And just, just this week, we've been granted funding from the group to uh, get training, actually, <laughs> Rachel mentioned this as well, by the Scottish Refugee Council to train our staff, the nominated persons, the, the key pe people in the University of Science group, to train them uh, in areas surrounding forced migrants uh, in higher education. Fantastic. Um, so, so I'm sorry, so the, being embedded in the university system uh, is, is, is crucially important. And this, I guess, is especially for uh, colleagues in Wales. Um, the Welsh government has uh, an admirable nation of sanctuary ambition. And so it's, it's very supportive of schools, colleges, universities becoming places of sanctuary. And this creates uh, a welcoming mindset in the community as a whole through education. And so um, I would really urge any colleagues from Welsh schools, universities, colleges who are here today to uh, uh, you know, again, take every effort. It is a, a, a national effort as well as a, a local effort, I believe. And um, finally, <laughs> Again, uh, similar to what colleagues have, have, have offered earlier, a few um, a few months ago, earlier this year, a colleague, uh, Dr. Kath Camps, and I, we we had some funding to to research uh, 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 what's really involved in setting up uh, a sanctuary scholarship scholarship scheme and language support programs for people working in universities. And we, we wrote a report uh, based on this research for Advanced HE um, on uh, uh, language provision and scholarships. And in this report, uh, uh, I wrote the report, so the language is very accessible. It's not a difficult read, um, but it contains a lot of um, advice and a lot of uh, discussion around the issues that, that we faced uh, uh, in expanding what we do in trying to be a better uh, University of Sanctuary. Um, and so that's free to download. I'll put the link into the um, in, into the chat box. Or if uh, Gun wants to Google <laughs> advanced HE language provision, I'm sure she can find it pretty quickly. Um, and so, yeah, to finish, um, really in the same vein as Rachel finished, we are still learning. We are still um, figuring out what more can be done. Uh, and we are still lobbying to um, improve what we do as a university. It is terrifically complex dealing with different home office requirements, language requirements, translation of documents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But really, it's absolutely worth every bit of bother. It really does um, change the life of folks who otherwise very often are left in limbo with very little you know knowledge of how their futures are going to pan out i believe that education offers real sanctuary real uh, uh hope for the future so i'd urge any colleagues get in touch uh, if you have any questions uh there's lots of people who are supporting you and willing to help thank you Lovely. Thank you so much, Mike, for this insightful presentation. I'm sure everyone has also found it as inspirational um, as I did. Finally, uh, for our uh, final speaker, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Gulwali Pasarli. Uh, Gulwali is a dedicated advocate, humanitarian and spokesperson for refugees and asylum seekers across the UK and Europe. He is the author of best-selling book, The Lightless Sky. Um, it's an award-winning book, and he's also a, a co-founder of My Bright Kite and a member of the Afghan Refugee Expert Network in Europe. Since arriving in the UK in 2007, after being forced to leave Afghanistan um, as a 12-year-old boy, Gulwali has achieved beyond all odds to become a well-respected and sought-after public speaker, influencer, and political campaigner for refugee rights, social justice, and for education as well. Among his many achievements, uh, Gulwali graduated with a politics degree from the University of Manchester in 2016, and he has read his MPA um, at Coventry University in 2018. So um, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today, Gulwali, and I will pass over to you now. Thank you, Mariam. Good evening, everyone. Um, thanks to Linda, Rachel, and Mike 
um, unfortunately, I don't have the same energy and uh, they had, uh, thanks for the work that you do, the efforts and dedication in supporting uh, refugees and people who are displaced. Um, the last 24 hours has been quite difficult for me. Sadly, I have lost an uncle back in Afghanistan uh, yesterday, last night evening. It's been quite um, devastating. I didn't want to, I did not want to cancel this talk because I thought it was already, I was already stressed out and I thought this would give me some some hope. Um, I guess death is, death is part of life, but the sad thing is that I have not been able to see him uh, for the last 15 years. Um, and that's the sacrifices that refugees make, but um, things are pretty bad overall. Uh, things are pretty bad overall in Afghanistan. Um, you know, as we, we see in the news, the Taliban take over. My intention was to focus which I will still do focus on my educational journey, my educational experience. But um, I was really, um, you know, saddened to find out my uncle was uh, uh, un unwell for a few years. Uh, and then, you know, he was in a lot of pain and, and he suffered. And unfortunately, I wasn't able to be there and to support him because as a refugee, I couldn't travel to Afghanistan. And also recently when I became citizen, I couldn't go because Kabul fallen. There's no planes, there's no flights into the country and the situation is still pretty, um, uh, you know, unreasonable. But anyhow, I just want you to hold on to your loved ones, um, hold them dearly. I mean, I have, um, my grandma passed away a few years ago. I wasn't able to see her. My little sister passed away. A lot of good things also happened. My brother got married, my sister got married. I'm sorry, this is uh, becoming a uh, depressing and sad, uh, you know, I didn't want to be, uh, I didn't want to end this event being being sad, but anyhow, uh, things happen, and I just think we need to stay hopeful and stay optimistic. And I think my faith helps me in that, and I hope uh, my uncle is in a better place tonight than he was yesterday, where he was in a lot of agony uh, and pain. Anyhow, um, I left Afghanistan as a child. Actually, I arrived to the UK on the 15th of November. So basically, coincidentally, today is the day I arrived 14 years ago. So tomorrow starts my 15 year, 15th year in Britain. Um, I left Afghanistan alongside my brother in 2006. I was age 12. He was a little older than me. And we had to flee. We were forced to flee because of the conflict in war, which sadly going back to square one or, or perhaps a lot worse. Um, I was separated from my brother, so I, I traveled on my own at the hands and mercy of smugglers. I traveled through 10 countries um, around 12,000 miles instead of being four or 5,000 miles because of the back and forth. I was um, arrested in almost every country, in prison, uh, deported. You know, I tell this to in, in, in the lightless sky that let alone being treated as a child, I wasn't even treated as a human being. And it was pretty heartbreaking. I crossed the Mediterranean. I was almost to, you know, our boat was about to be capsized. Thankfully, we survived. But in the last 14 years that I've been in Britain, things has not improved. Things has got worse. And uh, I've been seeing videos of people being, um, you know, literally pushed to, drown, to be drowned or left in the middle of the water by the Greek Coast Guard who saved us. And I... I've been seeing a following a case of humanitarian activists and people who rescued people at the sea in Greece in 2015-16 are now on trial for espionage and for terrorism charges for protecting people and uh, charges against them, amongst other things, uh, of smuggling. These are individuals, uh, humanitarian workers doing you know, what they can to save lives are now criminalized. So it's very dangerous what the world is heading to, and particularly what's happening in the UK with the immigration bill as well. So there's a lot to be concerned about, but it's good to see uh, universities playing their part. And uh, I made it to the UK after a year of being on this journey. And the reason I came was, uh, sadly, I was unwelcomed across half of the world. I had a terrible month in Calais. It was miserable. It was cold. And now I feel, I think about people there right now who are about 2,000 people stranded there uh, in the cold, in this, in this condition, which should not exist. It's a shame for Britain. It's a shame for France. It's a shame for Europe and for the world. And I think, you know, people, humans are treated uh, which we wouldn't even treat animals like that. So yeah, uh, the thing that makes me angry, the things that makes me do what I do, campaigning and advocating for refugees' rights, and the reason I wrote the book as well, which is published in seven countries in six languages, which I didn't think when using my suffering and experiences, negative experiences, for something positive. So you know, I hope things changes. I hope you know we we show compassion, and humanity, and solidarity with these people, and, and provide safer passage. We saw people um, uh, people were missing yesterday or the day before in the English Channel. Uh, you know, we've, many have died, sadly, trying to cross in small boats. Uh, so, you know, I was hopeful things will improve in terms of, you know, uh, more resources and support for higher education for refugees, investing in their future, helping them achieve their aspirations, allowing asylum seekers to work, uh, improving family reunification, and all these good things that campaigns have been happening on. But the UK government somehow uh, chose to be, you know, to deter people. Uh, the, the, the policies, the objective has been uh, to make people's life as, as hell as possible and, and as hostile as possible. When I go to the UK, I was physically safe and protected. 
Uh, actually, I was welcomed by the people, but not so much by the state. There was a system of disbelief. My age was disputed. My nationality was disputed. Um, it took me two years to challenge the Home Office and Social Services about my age dispute and my nationality dispute in Kent. Uh, things were not great for me. Things became so bad that I thought there was no point to life. I did not lose hope on the journey to the UK over a year at the age of 12, but I lost hope when I was safe and secure. That's the system that you're dealing with. And uh, the system needs to become humane. The system needs to somehow improve because right now the, the way the government is going about it is creating more fear and hatred towards refugees and migrants when in fact we host less than 1% of the world refugees when you know, uh, we are number 25th in the world for hosting refugees according to our population. And this idea that people should go anywhere but Britain is quite you know, illogical and immoral because how do you expect France and Italy and Germany who takes five or 10 times more asylum application than we do a year uh, to do more? We need to, you know, we need to play a fair share. We can't penalize people for coming to Britain irregularly, which is their human right. Climbing asylum is not a crime, but the government wants to make it a crime. It wants to uh, you know, penalize people for doing so and actually imprison them, uh, which makes me really you know, sudden and upset. And I'm sure most of us are to see instead of ending detention, we're going to increase the detention and in, in, instead of improving the efficiency of decision-making in the home office, it will cause more delays and more chaos uh, for people and put people in limbo. People will not be granted refugee status. Even if they are refugees, they will be granted temporary status with this bill. Uh, they will have no access to family reunification. Actually, they will have no access to higher education, even though if they're refugees. At the moment, if you have refugee status, if you have humanitarian protection, you could actually go to university. But with this new bill, that is limited. Anyways, I was able to find my brother who was in the UK when I arrived. Uh, I was able to overcome all the adversity and challenges with the help and support of many, many kind people, uh, social workers, youth workers, people who uh, believed in me and supported me. Uh, I was fostered many years later, actually two years later, three years later when I arrived. I had the chance to go to school. I had to fight to go to school. It took me a while before I was able to because of the age dispute and the nationality dispute with the Home Office and Social Services. I moved to Bolton where my brother was living in Greater Manchester. I attended school Saturday near 10, I managed to get 10 GCCs despite English being my fifth language. Um, I still learn, I'm still struggling, but I work extremely hard and I got a lot of support and help from my teachers. They believed in me. Um, in fact, in the beginning, I thought I wasn't going to be able to get one GCCs, but when I went to my year 11, I started my GCCs and did quite well. Went into Bolton Six from college, did my politics and philosophy. I mean, I just said it in a few sentences, but it was a year of hard work and commitments and dedications and uh, determination, but also the support of my foster carers and teachers, mentors, befrienders. There was a lot of people involved in my life, which I'm grateful to them uh, for their support and their uh, encouragement. I, uh, alongside not only finishing uh, school, I lived with like 50 certificates of achievement. And 10 years later or more now, the school still invites me to present awards and certificates. And uh, they have actually named an award after me, calling it Gulwali Pasale's Award for Overcoming Adversity. It makes me really humble. Um, and I literally was part of the school council, Senate, I got involved in the school life. And I think when refugees or people like myself, we had very few opportunities. So when we got the chance, I took on, I took on every opportunity that I could, even though with my broken English, and I uh, did quite well. And then when I went to college and I was part of the Equality and Diversity Committee, I was a student governor representing 1600 students. Um, just I, I was able to do work outside, like you know, youth activism, participation work with the British Youth Council, the Children's Society, uh, the UK Youth Parliament, the local youth council, the children care council. I was just involved in so many things and that actually also helped me with my mental health uh, struggles because I still have nightmares uh, from, you know, growing up in a war zone, seeing family members die and seeing, seeing the situation uh, of Afghanistan back in 2001 where, uh, you know, it was uh, uh, an active war zone for a few months. And so these things remind me and also seeing the news of people drowning, people dying, it resonates, it brings back memories, but the thing that was support helpful to me, I did some counseling, but what helped me was keeping active, keeping busy, keeping engaged uh, with activities and, and trying to do good, trying to com contribute to society, trying to help you know homeless people, children in charity, children in poverty, and other people uh, who are struggling. Uh, so trying to you know um, make a difference and have an impact. I was able to go to university through um, Manchester Access Program which I like to encourage more investors. I think, you know, uh, Linda mentioned that the university um, of Sussex have a, uh, an access program as well as I think Rachel mentioned. I think access program was very, very um, good for me. So whilst I was doing my A-levels, uh, a sixth form college in Bolton, I got the opportunity to go and do this access program during weekends and evenings. There was a lot of extra work, but I went and took the opportunity. Um, 
And uh, it really helped me. I was able to get into university life before actually going to university. They downgraded to my grades. I needed to study PPE and I needed AAA. And they said, well, I could come and do it with BBB, BBC. Uh, and so it was a, a really, you know, a, it was a, a proper university a program. So do assessments and everything else to trying to get used to university life. It was mostly for people from disadvantaged backgrounds. Uh, and there were not many refugees in there, but I was one of the few uh, refugee and, and somebody from, from the care system. And when I was able to get into university and they have actually given me an offer, I didn't have a status. I didn't have my refugee status. And so the university would take me on as an international student. It was a very stressful time because not only did I have to submit my UCAS application trying to do this map access program and I had to submit their um, you know, assessments and do the coursework and things. I had to worry constantly about my legal status. I was in a limbo for five years tried everything that I could. The home office wouldn't believe me and wouldn't grant me status. Uh, uh, and uh, I, the investor was like, you have to pay 14,000 pound. We like to have you. It was like, if I had 14,000 pound, I wouldn't be going to uni. And thank you very much. I mean, um, it was a, yeah, it was a really bizarre situation where I, I fulfilled the academic requirements and I worked extremely you know, hard. I got a lot of support, but I wasn't able to go to university. So there's, there were a lot of people in my case. And actually I was lucky enough to find and approach article 26 that was the only kind of uh, you know charity in existence. Now it's great to see the investive century and stars. And uh, since 2015, more and more investors have been giving scholarships and more opportunities for refugees and asylum seekers. But back in 2013, when I went to Manchester Uni, there were very very few investors actually part of the uh, scholarship program, the Article 26. But thankfully, at the end, I got my status and I was able to apply for student finance just before the deadline, uh, and I was able to go to university. But it was not easy. Uh, especially, you know, um, what was happening back home. There was a lot of things uh, stressing me out and making my life difficult. But then at the same time, I wish I just had an opportunity to go and get an education. Education was so important to me. It was what has got me through all the struggles uh, and, and, and mental health challenges and emotional problems. But that three years at university was challenging, but rewarding. I left with the, you know, just going there in itself was an achievement, even though, you know, my family back home, my father was a doctor and I had a kind of an educated family. but I don't think anybody has gone to university. I think my father did his some sort of um, uh, degree or diploma in Peshawar refugee camp where he became a doctor when, when he was a refugee there. Uh, but I was like, you know, in my whole family, I had the chance to go and get a degree and just to go there to university was in itself an achievement. And then I left with a, a distinguished medal of achievement of being a student of the year. And I, I don't like praising myself, but I, go, I got a lot of support at Manchester. It was, a, it was a great place to be and I'm glad they're now providing more scholarships and support for refugees. And uh, when I was there, I was able to have some impact and in, in get to know all the senior leadership people and trying to you know, speak to them about these issues and, and encourage them to give scholarship. Actually, they became University of Century. I was onto them uh, from 2014, 15. And they're like, yeah, you're already a splice of Century. And this is the thing I hear. I do school talks. I'm going to end soon. I go to schools and I go to universities and I do talks. I've done like 400 or so in the last five years that uh, all sorts of places across Britain, 200 cities and towns uh, or more. And people said to me, look, oh, we are already a place of sanctuary. We are already a place of welcome. Why do we need to get an award? Why do we need to get recognition and maybe controversial? Some of our community, community members might not like the idea that you know we are openly uh, encouraging refugees and asylum seekers. I'm like, well, that's the whole point. You may be a place of welcome, welcoming, which is good, but you know, getting this recognition, it's very prestigious. It's recognizes your work. and. And also it kind of, you know, helps you to put full resources together and do more to help, um, you know, displaced people, help refugees, asylum seekers, kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. So I'm glad Manchester became universities of sanctuary. I think I presented their award to them a few years ago. Um, anyhow, I then was sent to Coventry, which I really enjoyed. I did my master's there. I never thought I'll do a master's. Only about 3% refugees actually get the chance to get, you know, go to higher education, about 60%. Refugees kids get an opportunity to go to primary school, according to the UNHCR. About 24% get the chance to go to secondary education, and only 3% have an access because of these barriers and these obstacles and challenges, as was mentioned by Mike and others about, you know, these uh, elites, these English language exams and your different qualifications, lack of status. Not having status is the main cause. And I'm glad in Scotland they, you know, allow refugees to basically, you know, be home students. But in England, there's so much hostility. Manchester University was like, oh, we will take you, but we can't take you as a home student. It's just not possible. Um, and the only, they were only offering one scholarship through uh, Article 26, which the university wasn't even aware of. I found out uh, thereafter. So, uh, you know, I, I would say 
what we need to do is we need to uh, we need to invest, encourage universities to have more access programs, speak to their people with lived experience to find out how to improve things. And I think having more resources and research in the subject of refugees and asylum seekers, I think having academic reports, hopefully, you know, encouraging the government of the benefits of providing these investments, because I know the opportunities that I had, the investment that Britain, the, the British government or the British state has invested in me, I'm trying to return it back. And I was hoping to go back to Afghanistan and to trying to become a parliamentarian, become an ambassador for the country and so on and so forth. But sadly, that dream is now a far you know, distance. But you know, these young refugees, when they get these education and these opportunities, I have friends who are scientists, who are engineers, who are doctors, who are accountants, and they're all paying their taxes, they're working hard. And I feel like we shouldn't you know, provide these access and, 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 and opportunities because these people will contribute in the future, but we should do it simply because it's the right thing to do. I mean, we shouldn't be depriving people of education, which is their human rights. And especially people are, are you know, struggling and striving to become better and to contribute to society. We have shortage of so many you know, people, so many um, occupations. And I think university could play a, a really good part in, in challenging the hostile environment through, as I said, through research, providing more resources, more scholarship, and getting their you know, students uh, to actually share the, their achievements. Because you know, um, the, the refugee students from every university have, have have done remarkably well, despite with the challenges of the language, the culture, fitting in and so on and so forth. I will end because I've spoken for about 15 minutes and I, I thank you for your condolences. I can see the messages, I'm grateful. And um, I hope, you know, I have the chance to see my family at some point. I haven't seen my mother uh, for the last 15 years and, and my, 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 the rest of my family and it's been, uh, it's been difficult. So please continue being kind um, to each other, to people uh, who are displaced and, and support in any way you can to challenge this hostility. Uh, the fear and hatred towards us. I'm just a normal, ordinary person. I'm not. I'm not threatening anyone, and I think people should not fear people like me. Uh, but unfortunately, the government and the right-wing media are trying to say, you know, we are basically criminals, and you know, we are. We should be stopped, and we should. You know, the government is even speaking about turning boats around in the English Channel, uh, and um, and and at the border officers. I saw a tweet of the border officers who wouldn't do their job. I mean, their job to drown people, to to, to you know, to break international law. Things are bad within the refugee protection internationally. There are 80 million displaced people, 30 million refugees. Actually, now there's an increase to about 85 million displaced people, forcibly displaced people, and the 30 million refugees. But uh, there is hope when, when I hear stories of you know, what, what Linda and Rachel and Meg, as well as what Mariam is doing, and you guys are doing across the UK in, in your locality and in universities, working with these local organizations, these charities and individuals. I think that gives me hope. Uh, and that's something to be optimistic about. The government has completely failed us in completing its duty towards the, the most vulnerable people in society. But I hope we can keep up the pressure in trying to make a, a difference, have an impact, make the government accountable for their actions, especially when it comes to uh, refugees and asylum seekers. I thank you for your time and I hope um, to meet you in person. And I hope, uh, I hope next time we meet in better circumstances. Wow, that was so powerful, Gowali. I, I don't think I can give justice to your speech and I don't think we could have um, ended it in a better way. And I think I can speak to everyone when I say I wish we could hear more and more from you about your remarkable story. Um, but sincere and deep condolences and I'm so sorry to hear about your loss. And we are grateful that you still joined us despite everything and you still spoke. Um, it's very difficult to explain the feeling of going through so much loss, but wanting to, to give and wanting to help. And that's exactly what you did. Um, so thank you for always striving to make a difference despite everything. And I hope and we all hope that you can be reunited with your family as soon as possible. Um, it's, it's so powerful. It's, it's so powerful. Uh, I can help.